but your brain, you're in the nuts domain. Come on in, it's about to begin. Welcome to the Nerds Domain Podcast. In these episodes, we discuss a movie from the Criterion Collection. What is the Criterion Collection? The Criterion Collection is a continuing series of important classic and contemporary films on home video. Four average nerds watch a classic movie and discuss what they like and don't like. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Criterion Collection uh, edition of the Nerds Domain Podcast. I'm Matt. I'm John. I'm Jess. And Shirley is unfortunately out and sick today. So she will not be joining us. But we have watched things to come for our Criterion movie. And you've heard what the Criterion Collection is all about already. Because that's something Scott put in our intro, thank God. Yay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so, let's get right down to it. John, would you yes. like to give us the, uh, the synopsis okay. of things to come? Uh, well, things to come is based on a um, H.G. Wells. Wells story um, called The Shape of Things to Come. And is all about uh, the world um, in the future of 1936. Um, uh, a World War II breaks out and is much longer in this uh, in this uh, sci-fi story, um, spanning at least four decades before. Well, it goes, it, it, there's, I'm sorry, go ahead. It, it does. It yeah. goes. Uh, the war breaks out in 1940, so a little beyond World War II in the in our timeline. Um, but the the story go this this story goes all the way to 2035, so even into our future. Yeah, the the war is over in 1970, wasn't it? Well, 66 is when the Walking Plague happens. Uh, so it, depending on where you want to split that hair, um, they go. Yeah, the war starts. They go up to, um, and you're following a character named John Cabal. Was that his name, John? Yeah, John and then his grandson in the future. Anyway, you're following uh, John Cabal, and he uh, joins the war effort as a pilot. Um, there's some scenes that um, are sort of like you know war. What is it good for? Um, kind of invoke that feeling, that emotion, um, and then it it propels into the future where we see um, John has moved to the Middle East and set up a uh, Utopian society of scientists and engineers, and he returns to his hometown, which they call every town uh, uh, England. I don't think they put, they don't technically put England on there, do they? Yes. Oh, do yeah, they? They it do. Is, it is in England, and they okay. call it every town. Okay. Um, the set design they use is actually London. They just rather than make up streets, yeah, they build London streets for their sets. Okay. Um, okay. So technically, it's London, but it's every town because it's speculative fiction. Uh, from 1930s um, and he when he returns he's in a more advanced airplane and more advanced tech but every town is run by a barbaric guy who alternatively goes by the chief or the boss yeah um, he uh, and he basically runs things by um, power of uh, power of his speech and persuasive abilities and the might you know might makes right kind of thing I say the war isn't technically over because they have the people of the hills that they are fighting. That it's never clearly stated what happened, why they're fighting those people. I've read some different some different opinions that you know eventually the enemy stopped attacking, so they're warring with the people in the hills because they're the next town over. They're all com competing for resources. Other people say that. Um, they lose track of who the enemy is and they just start shooting at anyone that's not standing beside them. Hmm. So, like, it's... They may be the enemy, they may not be the enemy. Either way, it, it devolves into a barbaric society. Um, planes don't work anymore. They've all worn out. Uh, they can't may produce their own gasoline anymore. And then, um, the Wings Over the World Society, out, based out of the Middle East, sends, their, sends John Cabal back to scout out the, the area... He gets captured. Eventually, the wings over the world send in more people, um, and a utopian society is built. And we see uh, we jump to the year twenty thirty five, where um, there's still dissension among the humans because they are tired of the progress, the constant need for progress that John Cabal and Wings Over the World have instilled in 
you know, demand of the people, so they want to relax and not advance. Meanwhile, um, Cabal's grandson, I want to say Oswald was his name, mm. um, but either way, last name is the same, and he's played by the same actor, um, is trying to get a mission, uh, trying to get a, uh, basically the first people on the moon, or to the moon, and uh, they're wrestling with their society, problems with society there, um, and, and the movie ends with a, a rousing speech mm-hmm. by Cabal um, and about the need for human advancement. Yep. So uh, the book originally was written by H.G. Wells in 1933. So this yes. actually came out as a book and very quickly turned into a movie. It did. Um, I feel like there's three acts here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, totally. There's there's the starting of the war with the enemy. Which is a very ever, short yeah. act. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and that one goes all the way to... The walking sickness, and I think the walking sickness ends that act. Yeah, yeah well, because they go into the montage yeah, with yeah. the years, and that montage, that montage until '66, that's all part of the first act, in my opinion. Agreed. The second act is in every town with the boss or you know the chief, whatever, whatever they call until it, until yeah. that until the second is jump. resolved. Yeah, the and then it jump. jumps again yeah. to a third act. Yes, um, agreed. I think that these three acts are good. But I think that they could have given more time to any of the three acts, and it would have been better. Yeah. Um, well, and my reading on the movie um, did you did you see in the credits? I don't believe there was actually a director. H. G. Wells himself was in charge of the filming of this movie, oh, really? according hmm. to Wikipedia. Uh, you, you might be right. Yeah, uh, I'm just reading what was on Wikipedia. I don't remember seeing a director's credit myself. Because I read the Wikipedia article first. I may have looked away or blinked. Uh, no, it's uh, William um, Cameron Menzies. Okay, well, the story goes that H.G. Wells was actually on hand for the filming of this movie. Yeah. And um, there's actually a two-hour cut that was originally submitted. Hmm. Two or three-hour cut, I forget, that was originally submitted. Basically, the studio, the story goes, the studio allowed Wells to film everything. Every bit that he wanted to film, they let him do it. He did it thinking he was going to have final say on what his movie, what this movie looked like. But in reality, the, the studio was like, no, we're just going to cut our film out of whatever you produce. Oh. And they tried, they got a much shorter version put in theaters. Clearly. And, and actually shorter than the version we saw. Yes. The like version, 92 minutes was, was the theater version. Uh, I, just, I think it was shorter than that. Was it? Okay. Because ours was like 92, 93 minutes. It was 80. It was only an hour and a half on you. An hour and 47. Okay, 50. well. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah. Still a big, big chunk of yeah, movie. Yeah, big chunk of movie. So, um, so now that we've kind of given you the idea, we're going to go into spoilers. We don't normally spoil, or warn about spoilers, but we should start doing that, even on Criterion movies. Sure. Cause, yeah. So, But, well, then do we want to quickly say what we oh, thought yeah, of yeah, the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Before we get into spoilers. Um. Me? Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I did not think this movie was very good. Um, we talk, I talked briefly about how they filmed one movie, the studio cut another one, somebody else cut another one, then it went through the process of American movie theaters mm-hmm. who would cut the movie themselves. Yeah. Um, and we have this sort of bastardized version of what the original intent was because parts of the movie don't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, each act is fine in and of itself. It's not a bad each is not are not bad scenes. They don't go together very well. Mm-hmm. They don't um, get into the details enough. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, I love the story, the concept yeah. that H.G. Wells put yeah, out, yeah. but the film falls flat. Um, it's the second sci-fi. Well, it's the first British sci-fi movie, according yeah. to what I've yeah, read. Yeah. So, you know, it gets merit, it gets a few points of, on its own there. Um, it's worth checking out if you're a history buff into films. If you just want to watch a sci fi movie, pick something else. So, out of stars? Oh, uh, two. Two? Would you want to read the book now that you've seen the yes. movie? Yes. Okay. I want to read the story and the book now. Jesse, what do you think? Uh, kind of along his lines, the story was great, but it wasn't well done. Okay. Each act would have been a great movie, it would have been a great three part series. Okay. Um, yeah, Shirley and I talked about that. Even a, maybe a mini series, yeah, like a five day long, like hour long episodes mini series on TV or HBO. Even could yeah. do. Wow, I couldn't imagine what HBO. Would I would like to see this redone. Right. Okay, yeah, definitely. That would yeah. be actually, yeah, Game just, of Thrones or or yeah. 
Deadwood style, like yeah, where you even can, FX the FX even that yeah, yeah. doing like you know your season ends, you do a little bit of a time jump, and yeah, a little bit yeah. more of a time jump, and that yeah. would be cool. Some scenes were incredibly powerful. I f- actually fell asleep during others. Fair enough. Um, not that I fell asleep on this one because I didn't. But yeah, I, I, I might have a little bit. Don't don't watch movies lying down on your back in the bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it might have been my fault. Yeah, I, I, it's a it's, little below average. I'd give it a two, also. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have to disagree with both of you, and there's a couple of reasons. The planes in the third act, or in the second act, are amazing. For the the future planes or yeah, the war the, planes, the the, yeah. the 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 giant, giant, giant planes, yeah, are amazing. Now, I'm I'm not saying everything was perfect in those scenes, but for 1936. That, that was pretty freaking yeah, seamless. That was a, a great technical For me, and, I, and I'm mm-hmm. trying to take this out of, like, we're in 2013, sure. 2014, Can't 80 blame years them. later, you know? Yeah. Like, looking at this in an 80-year, like, outside of that 80-year scope, I think this movie's amazing. I thought the oh, cinematography yeah. and the presentation were good. I think it suffered because it was a hack to get And I think, I think, I, I, I have to agree with you there. I just don't think it suffers as much. And I think maybe it's because I really wanted to love this movie once I started watching it. Because it's revolutionary in what they're trying to do. Uh, the vision, the scope of, of what they're trying to do is huge. A hundred years. And yeah. and they kind of, in 1933, he calls World War II. And they never call out the Germans, but we all know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, that, uh, did you not listen to the guy he shot down? Really? He had a oh, very East okay. European accent. Yeah. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah. He, um, he but, did kind of predict that they were still using gas and yeah. trench warfare. But yeah, was, still, the fact yeah. that he predicted the war was... And that planes were going to be a big part of it. And very yeah, and planes were well, a much it, bigger part of it. Yeah. In 1933, there were stirrings in Germany and there were a lot yeah, of yeah, problems. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it wasn't but like I, he was being prophetic, but, but his... But he broke this 100-year-long thing yeah. out of it. And I just the vision there. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of overacting, but then this is the age where they're still bringing in stage actors who overact. Right. That's what they have to do. Yeah. So, I, overall, looking at the movie and realizing what it is for when it was, I'm gonna have to give it like a three and a half. Wow. Now mm-hmm. I understand why you would get why you would say two, but I think the the story itself has a lot of merit. It does. There, you're right. There's no connection between the three acts, and that is a very weak point. But when you look at the technical aspects. What they're trying to do with it, the fact that they that, by the way, first first time we ever see zombies, because let's face it, yeah, the yeah, walking sickness for yeah. zombies, it was. This exactly. is very, I think this is very important, and it's not a bad film. I think there are things wrong with it, yeah, but I don't think it's a bad film. So, that said, I, I would give it like a three and a half. All of Dude. that together, though. I think it would. It is ripe for a remake. I mean, for oh, God's yeah. sake, they're remaking. They're making a Jim movie. Yeah, Jim and the Holograms. Incredibles two. Uh, well, okay, that's a, that's gonna be awesome. I don't care what you say, but no, I love Incredibles. They have. They are. They are making movies out of everything now. Yeah, freaking Hasbro games have movies. Yeah, that's yeah. Battleship. It's gotta be better than Battleship. And, and Rocket, you know, honestly, Battleship was not terrible. It but was a fun Battleship walk, was a yeah. bad um, concept. Yeah, to, yeah, to pull from. Rock and Soccer Robots and Real Steel was a better... Yeah, it really was. Better p- If they had named it Rock and Soccer Robots, I would have walked out of that theater. <laughs> really? I haven't watched it yet, but I liked it. <laughs> I um, saw Real Steel before I realized it was the movie based on the yeah. Rock and Soccer property. And I really... Okay, so let's back to this. Yeah. This, this, is ripe. Like, yeah. this is absolutely right for is. either. I think breaking it into three seasons is mo- too much. Maybe. But maybe that's just because I'm I'm looking at an hour and fifty minute movie and taking that into three seasons of ten hours a season. Let's just say we're going to go on the HBO, HBO track of 10, 10 episodes. Game of Thrones. Yeah, that that's thirty hours that you're stretching an hour and and fifty minute movie into. Now that doesn't mean they couldn't do it, and that doesn't mean somebody couldn't write it that way. I'm just wondering how much would they have to add that H.G. Wells didn't intend, and how would that change the movie fundamentally? In the first act. But when they flash between the war is looming and people celebrating, mm-hmm. I could see that being dragged out a little bit longer. Oh, I'm with sure. just yeah. the fact of well, the they could establish the they could establish a lot of background there. Yeah. The, the politics they could yeah. explore the politics of where where I, are we in this world? I think the potential sweet spot for this is either yeah. a week long hour hour episode five episode miniseries. Yeah, so one hour a night, five nights, or a full season of twenty four episodes. 
maybe an hour, maybe half an hour. So or two seasons on or HBO. two or two seasons on HBO or two seasons on uh, like FX, yeah. which again they're yeah. they're like thirteen ep- episodes. I think it has potential, very solid potential here. Hex, I think USA has eighteen episode seasons right now for they Psych do, and for uh, Burn Notice. They do two half seasons do per they? year. I okay. forget how yeah. long they are, but yeah. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential, not just to make this a movie, because I think I don't think it would be bad as a movie. No, I, but I, I think it would be better as a series or a mini series or I don't know, a couple of seasons, something more than what it is. They could really. Uh, the way I see they extend it out the, I mean first off you have to boil it down to its main themes it's okay, all absolutely. about I guess we've we've sort of bre- breached the spoiler barrier sorry folks we yep. forgot we were, we're going to go that. into the spoilers spoilers now. Go ahead. Um, yeah. the, the, the theme of this movie is man needs to always be in a state of progress mm-hmm. if you if you sit back and and take a break as a as a whole uh, I, the, this whole speech at the end really says it the individual person can have time off and relax. Man, as a as a species, as a culture, constantly needs Excellent. progress. Yeah. That's that's the only way we're ever going to get out of the the rut that even today I think we are in of yeah. political backstabbing and 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 machinations of of our our of our politicians. Mm-hmm. Not to bring this political because yeah, we no, could I... do this forever, but. Um, or be here forever if we did that. But the theme of this this book or this movie is um, you have to make progress. Yeah. And um, when you stop and, and just try to be happy with what you have, that's when you realize you're not happy and war breaks out. Okay. So um, what the, in my opinion, if you wanted to extend it, what you do is you spend a whole season on right before war ending with the war breaks out mm. and Cabal joins the army yeah. uh, or becomes a pilot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that way you can build the real emotional connections. Um, yeah, definitely. There's a doctor who is a friend of Cabal's and his daughter. Mm-hmm. Where's the mother? She, you know, yeah. we know she died because of the, what yeah. they tell us, but we never see her. Yeah. They could also go into the German pilot who totally the show. Family. Yeah. There's a, in this, in this version of the movie, there's a enemy pilot that, um, John Cabal shoots down. That's how we learn John Cabal is a pilot mm-hmm. in yeah. the movie. He shoots him down, but doesn't kill him. They, they both he survives the crash, um, but he's gravely wounded. And there is an incoming gas cloud when Cabal finds him. Yeah, that, he, that the pilot caused. The pilot potentially dropped that bomb. There are several pilots with yeah. bombs, but he's like, he's he, they wax poetically about. I made you know, this gas cloud fell out of my plane. I created it basically. And it's right that it's going to kill me. Then this little girl runs up, and the pilot, the the enemy pilot, gives her his gas mask, so she can survive this gas cloud. Um, and then the pilot goes on. He's like, "I probably killed her family. You know, the reason she's an orphan now is because of me. But you know, and now I've saved her life. How ironic is that? So you could really get into some deep emotional stuff. The problem being, you need to focus on the progress. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you, it, you would want to get bogged down in the emotional, personal stories, but the overall theme of that progress is necessary to, yeah. sur- to, to move on would have to be integrated into it. I think I think focusing on on John Cabal, Cabal there, I think that really would bring people into the, the story more. It I would. felt a little disconnected from the story, but I talked it up yeah. too. It's 1936. They're, That's how they, they tell have the story. A ref, and they have it refined to what we're used to now. So I yes. was a little okay with that. Um, I really, I can't express how I'm enough. The only thing that bothered me about the planes were the parachutes and they were just ba- badly handled. Well, they were toys. Yeah. That kid, they were little plastic men on parachutes yeah. dropped in front of the camera. Yeah. Then they overlaid the, the planes and the clouds. So yeah. it was... But the planes and the clouds, I thought, looked really good. There, there were some things in the first act that kind of, I thought, was low quality even for their times. Like when, when they were first bombing London or every town. And you'd, you'd see the explosion and it kind of looked like somebody dropped like the letterheads from the, the buildings. Oh, okay. Yeah. When they fell. Which I... Yeah. Well, they, it still I mean, got to me. It was still a powerful scene, but. and it was funny to watch. Um, they would have the explosion, like there'd be yeah. a person there. They'd have the explosion. The screen would literally fill with smoke and obscure the person in a blink of an eye, 
and then the smoke would clear and the person was just not present. Yeah. Like it was it was, you know, special effects at the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So but they, they went through the effort of building three or four city streets yeah. in total mm-hmm. and then destroyed them. Well <laughs> it was a lot of it was a lot of uh miniatures work too. It was. There was. Uh, especially towards the... I don't know if you noticed it towards the end, but they, oh, yeah. they panned across that the city and all the... Like, there was a lot of work being done there with miniatures, which I thought was great. Yeah. I love miniature work. I, yeah. think it, I think it's solid use. Yes. But, oh, so we all... I mean, I know you two gave it a two, but you enjoyed the movie. Oh, I, I liked it. Like I said, that first act was absolutely great. I, uh, I went on a trip to England back in 2000 and went to Dover, and they had a World War II museum. Mm-hmm. And at the start of it, it had these signs. You walked into this the city streets, and it had signs up of looming war. Then you'd walk through a curtain, you'd hear the air raids, you'd go through it, and then it was just a blowed out city. You had to walk through the city to get to the next part. Okay. And watching the rubble and stuff, it really kind of got to me because it felt like, I mean, it looked just like it did. I mean, it was, it was surprisingly powerful for how low tech they did yeah yeah okay so um what did you guys think of the space gun best mode of space travel ever it is yeah that was that was bad yes. science fiction right yeah there. well it's yeah I, well i mean it no. was and it wasn't the, when when um i forget who the character the character's name is irrelevant you meet a great grandfather in the future in 2035 uh, humans have basically become immortal. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only reason a human dies is um, either through violence or extreme two or three hundred years of age. Mm-hmm. Um, so you meet a great grandfather who looks like a forty, well maybe sixty year old man. Yeah. yeah. Now of nowadays he's silver haired, but he's still virile yeah. oh, and yeah. spry, and he, he's talking to his granddaughter and. Um, about how the space gun works and its electricity and magnets inside of magnets inside of magnets mm-hmm. that launch the pod. So that was an interesting concept because you know we've we have um, well, this was the same concept where he explains what a sneeze is <laughs> and what it was like when we had, when they had colds. Yeah, yeah, because he remembers when colds were a thing, but now they're eradicated. Yeah, um, but the explanation of the space gun to the little girl, I enjoyed. The actual application of the space gun was dumb. I still don't get how they're going to reland him. That's going to be a hard hit. Yeah, they're they're hopefully going to crash into the oh, ocean. So or those something. special parachutes. Are yeah, there you go. Know. <laughs> the parachute will come um, from beneath. But them. yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 mission is to circumnavigate the moon and come back to Earth, uh, effectively slingshotting around the moon via its own gravity, because the pod that they are in has no known means of control. They don't talk right. about it. Yeah. Um, the space gun is it looks literally like the barrel of a of a revolver. It yeah. even they even went so far as to add the sight on the end, which I mean I they didn't really give you a scale, but I would say it was at least fifty feet wide. So yeah. it would block out the moon. You wouldn't know you were if you were on target because you couldn't see the moon. Yeah, and, and the moon was only in tar- on in in targetable area for a while. I mean, yeah, you and I talked about this, and I could kind of understand that, but. Move the gun. Well, yeah, I, I get you know if depending on where what season you're in, the Earth is tilted one way or the other, and the Moon is is relative to that. And maybe they needed to shoot as vertical as possible because if you put yeah. it at a downward angle, you lose a lot of power and yeah. atmosphere interferes. So you needed to get as vertical as possible. But the idea that they couldn't they couldn't didn't, couldn't conceive of a human controlled conveyance to the moon mm-hmm. like our shuttles and rockets or even our pods yeah, that we actually sh- use their planes look like they could do it i mean right when you, when yeah you they, see the future guy he's wearing a space helmet i'm yeah. just like oh wow yeah they've already been that, up there that space helmet that was like yeah. five feet tall yeah. in and of itself yes that, their future was very what we would call retro sci-fi nowadays yeah did you love that the, so when he was the pilot and he got caught by the chief that stupid helmet thing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what we were talking yeah, about. Okay. What, what that, did they do? I mean, it had it had no front cover. It was just a. It looked like it looked like a, a hood of a cobra. Yeah. That extended three feet above his head, and it just it sort of came to like slightly cover the top of his head, but there was still two well, three feet of clearance. Shirley in there. said something. I wish you were here. Uh, she said something about look. It was part of the cockpit. 
It, yeah, when he lands, yeah. it oh, is part sense. of the yeah. So it attaches, in, like, which, which, whatever, but that was the dumbest, like, when, when I wanted to go scoop some ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> when they first showed up, I thought they were literally going to already be from the moon. Like, that sun oh, okay, was up yeah, there, yeah. like, there were the international flight people from the moon colony of... Yeah. Well, and like, it was funny, what, what struck me about that thing the most was when they give it back to him at the end. What, what he does is he gets captured by the chief, and one of his... Uh, he makes friends with the other mechanic in town who's trying to fix the plane. They fix the plane and they put the guy in it and he flies off to the Middle East to tell Wings Over the World organization where Cabal is and that he's been captured. So then Wings Over the World sends in sleep gas bombs, not yeah, lethal. Except orphans. for one guy. Uh, those, know, the chief killed himself to not be captured. Those were, oh, those were that was peace those. gas. Peace gas. <laughs> yeah. We would call it sleep gas. But anyway, um, before the guy leaves every town to go tell uh, Wings Over the World, he gives Cabal back his helmet, which is his gas mask, which has nothing to cover his face. Yeah. No, it's magic. Yeah, it's magic super technology <laughs> that needs no glass or plastic or anything. I do no like how, how uh, optimistic HGOLs is about what we're going to create in the next hundred years. Cause well, I really want to... 2035, dude. Yeah, we got ten. Yeah. We got twenty years before we yeah. got a space gun. Yeah, well, he seems to be very lenient on governments, though. I mean, for a dystopic future, it crumbled with one guy being up, slightly upset with it. Yeah, and everybody's well. Yeah, sure, we're upset too. Let's take this thing down. Well, I, I mean, mean, it was it a was... pretty bad situation. The chief controlled everything, and you know, he and his wife ate well every night. And everybody cute. else seemed to eat well, though. I mean, no, they, they didn't. didn't. No, they didn't. No. were dirty. Yeah. Ragamuffin yeah. children in the street. Yeah, they clearly did not eat well. They looked plump because they were actors from 1930, but they weren't. You know, they weren't. Uh, they were. They were put in dirty dirt makeup. Yeah, and stuff. So, so H.D. Wells wrote over a 40 books. Is that all? Yeah. Well, you know that's a lot of books. It's still. I was, I was kidding because um, yes, it's over in, in in within a 60 year time span. Have you guys read anything else notable of his? Um, War, War of the Worlds, Island of Dr. Moreau. Yes, time Island of Dr. Moreau is, is one of my favorite books. Yes. I've read all those that you've mentioned so far. Uh, yeah. The Invisible Man. During yeah. the Center of the well, Earth, was that him? Time Machine was his first book. Yeah. Uh, During the Center of Earth is, is, yes, because they talk about it back to the future. Yeah, I've read that one. Um, uh, well, a lot of these I've never heard of. Yeah, well, and I mean, are those? is that a list of books or is that also short stories? And it's his bibliography novels? of novels. Of novels? Uh, I guess I could look up stories. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, it's not. So no, they, wow, he wrote a lot of short stories too. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. The abyss in the abyss. Ooh. The so yeah, if you included, yeah, if you included yeah. short stories and novellas, in you know, he's writing a ton more huh. than forty. Yeah, the Isle of Doctor Maroon is in my top ten book list. I, I really enjoyed that one. Oh, huh, interesting. Um, the one where they were good. eviscerating I just, yeah, animals. Yeah, and... I remember. It. I just don't remember it very well. Um, he actually wrote a uh, story, not a novel, called "A Story of Days to Come," in nineteen eighty or eighteen ninety seven. That looks like it was a, like a precursor to um, "Days to Come" or things. Things to come. Yeah, the shape of things to the come. The shape of things to come. Uh, he wrote a lot of dystopian stuff too. Which he did. Is really cool. Well, and it was always about, and, and well, the thing about all of it was, event. It was it went dystopic, and then. Human humanity started building its way out of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the time machine had the Morlocks, and I forget the surface, yeah. but you know they, um, you know they were. It was bad. It, it looked idyllic, and then it, you realize it was actually dystopian because the Morlocks were eating the idyllic people, yeah. and then the idyllic people fight back against the mutant Morlocks and blah blah blah. So. H.G. Wells was very optimistic in his in most of his writing in that we're going to hit dark times and it's going to be bad, but we can get through it if we band together and work for the betterment of the grace of, of humankind rather than individual gain. Yeah. So kind of socialist, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Dirty hippies. So, so uh, generally, how did you guys feel about it as a dystopian story? Do you like the ideas? Oh yeah, it was really. I mean, I was uh, thinking about the episode of Futurama where um, Fry and his girlfriend from the 20th century 
uh, meet up again. She freezes herself because Fry's not not mm-hmm. there to kick around anymore, and uh, they think they're freezing themselves to go to the year three thousand, and really they only go like two days. And yeah, um, that episode with the kid and the group of the gang of children that they interact with in that movie is pulled from this okay. particular story. Um, he doesn't challenge uh, Cabal doesn't challenge the chief to rule her, to a uh, roll off to win the chiefdom hood but um other other than that the sitting on top of the the junk pile and all that it's all very reminiscent okay so um as far as a dystopian story goes it's really it's a pretty good one yeah I just wish it was longer in parts. And yeah, shorter yeah, shorter in other parts. I, I, or explored the, yeah. the, the, you know, like the pilot, the guy that's trying to build the plane and the doctor. Yeah. Explored them more than just use them as a I, walk on, shove them off the screen. I also wish it followed more than just one person because it seemed like it was set up to follow a couple of people in that party. If, yeah. If, say, in the future they do do a remake of this, I would like to see more people followed throughout the time frames. Sure. But yeah, I was. I was very disappointed to see the little drummer kid killed in the rubble. Yeah. Because I had projected him as being one of them that was going to be playing later on in the future roles. Yeah. Was and, he the yeah. son of the guy who said war was impossible? Yeah. 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 And yeah, so that I was... I was a little disappointed in the fact that there was only the one guy who... Yeah, I mean, you get Cabal, you get the doctor. Yeah. Um, that guy dies at the very beginning of the movie, the the one with the, the drummer boy's son. Yeah. Um, and then later you get to see Cabal and the Doctor, and then in the future you see Cabal's great yeah. or grandson and his daughter. So it does follow one family, pretty hardcore, you know, pretty pretty regular, you know, yeah. exclusively. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like I said, if it got turned into another series, you could do. I'm just spitballing here, but you you follow the main character's family, but you have tertiary characters, and you show how. Cabal is all focused on the future and progress and that main theme of the show and he teaches that to his family whereas other characters don't or strive for it and fail or give up and how their lives fall apart because of the very you know they're not focused on Cabal's goal yeah um, you know so that that would be where I would take it if I was going to uh, write the write the series yeah um, so yeah I definitely would have you know established all the families at the beginning, and then follow them through the war, and into the future. And then in the future, you know, like there might be two that make Cabal and one other family have survived that long, and that's it. You know. Yeah. So overall, I think we enjoyed it enough. Um, Better than Village of Dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That that's just. Just consider that a statement that goes with every episode of <laughs> yeah, this no Criterion Collection um, podcast. So yeah. I'm sure you guys have heard already, but we did in fact fund our Kickstarter. So we are in fact going to Indie PopCon with two yeah, tables. Yeah. One for the Nerds Domain uh, podcasting group and then one for the Omega Nerds Network, which is what we're part of. Um, we would love to see you there. If you could go over to our website and click on the want to go to Indie PopCon link, that will take you to buy tickets with our code. Um, that will give us a little bit of credit. That will help us um, win some or uh, earn some stuff from Indie Popcon. No, no more tickets, um, shirts, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we will have uh, prints available there as well as shirts to sell, and we would love to have you there as well. Um, end of May is where when it is. You still have plenty of time to get your plans together. Yep. So we will also be on April fifth in Columbus, Indiana, for a small convention from twelve to five. Uh, it's called HoosierCon, not that HoosierCon that we talked about just a couple weeks ago. A different HoosierCon altogether. Is, that spelled, is this one spelled with an H? Yes, it is. So Actually, not, technically the other one spelled with an H, too. Well, it's just w- after H. the W. Yeah. It's who, <laughs> it's who is your con. Yes, this one is this Hoosiers. This one is Hoosiers, yeah, as yeah. in a person from Indiana. Uh, we will hopefully have prints there. depends on uh, what we can get produced between now and then. Um, and then, of course, we will be setting up at Gen Con, and you can check us out there at our game and our panel. Oh, we'll have a panel at any PopCon, too. I forgot about that. Um, so we on have podcasting of, on the cheap, right? That's, that's yes, podcasting concept. on the cheap. Since we are full of money yes. over here, yeah. um, so check that out, and uh, hopefully we'll get to see you at one of those events. We would love to meet all of our fans. I guess it's all of our fan one, <laughs> um, and uh, I think that'll do us tonight for Nerds Domain uh, on the Criterion Collection. 
we will talk to you guys real soon. And that's it tonight for us on the Nerds Domain Podcast. You can always send us an email at nerdsdomain at gmail.com or catch us on Twitter. Matt is at quiet. Scott is at underscore Big Daddy T underscore. Johnny is at Fool's Mask. Justin is at J underscore Kimmett. And Shirley is at SNED70 or the website at Nerds Domain. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Nerds Domain. We want to thank John Shop for our music. If you'd like to help us out, head over to the website and buy something through our Amazon link. It's the same price you always pay, but a little bit comes back to us. If you enjoy our podcast, we encourage you to give us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. We also have t-shirts available over at slashloot.com at tinyurl.com slash ndshirts. We'll talk to you real soon. This has been a production of the Omega Nerds Network, the network where it's on.